Welcome everybody to the High Return Real Estate Show. This is Jeff Schechter, aka Shecky, with my amazing and fabulous and daringly handsome business partner, Mr. Jack Gibson. How you doing, Jack? Oh uh, man, you want me to cut you some checks or something today, don't you? <laughs> something like that. Yeah. But we, uh, dude, I'm really excited about today's show because we've got a very unusual uh, father-son team in the real estate investing business. And these guys are doing everything. I mean, this is not exactly what you would call uh, passive investing. These are the guys that are serious down in the trenches that we can really, it's going to be a great show. We're calling the show the opposite of turnkey. And it's really there just to give people an understanding of all the things that go into creating a buy and hold type property and all the things that really have to happen in order to have a profitable income producing property and some of the things that you may not want to do so that you don't have a non-income producing property. Welcome to the High Return Real Estate Show, the podcast for heavy hitters. Two men, one mission. It's time to build your empire. Welcome back, everybody, to the High Return Real Estate Show, the show for heavy hitters. And we have got today two amazing guests. It's a father and son team named Pete and Isaac Barrow. Hi, guys. Hi there. Hey. Hey, we're happy to have you. And uh, Pete, you're the dad. And uh, you have uh, a kind of an illustrious past with, uh, you know, moving around in the mountains of West Virginia and DC, but you, I understand you had a long background doing uh, carpentry and, and cabinet making. So you're very handy by trade. Is that correct? Uh, I, uh, I think so. I hope so. Okay. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Indianapolis and in the role that you're in right now. Well, uh, we lived in the DC area the Maryland suburbs of DC for many years. And I always daydreamed about being in the property business there, but it's, uh, it just takes a lot of money to get started, which yeah. uh, frankly we didn't have. Um, now my older son, Sam, five years ago, moved out here to Indianapolis, not entirely for that reason, but partly because it was affordable and, uh, you know, the economy's stable. Um, and he started looking around and seeing what could be done here. I started coming out and visiting. He bought a house. We fixed it up. We bought another house, a foreclosure. We fixed it up. We bought another house, a foreclosure. We fixed it up. And we just kind of rolled from one thing to the next. Uh, at one point, one of my customers back in Washington offered to invest money. And we got a chance to get a big chunk of uh, duplexes uh, all at once. Really nice stuff. Um, and now this is uh, this is what we do full time, more more than full time. Yeah, it's a lot of elbow grease. <laughs> yeah, my elbows are <laughs> leaking grease all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, good. And I also want to want to introduce your son Isaac. Welcome. We're we're happy to have you. Tell us a little bit about. I know you don't have a whole lot of real estate background, but you are really the guy, you know, you're very much in the trenches. I mean, you're managing a lot of components of this business. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure, I mean, I guess I'll start with, I'll start with my background. Uh, I started out uh, basically, 2000, I mean, 2012, I was 19 years old, got my first real, I mean, my first job I was, and by 2014, I'd worked my way up to managing this family restaurant and I really liked it there uh, but I mean eventually you know you got to move on to bigger and better things I moved here in 2016 uh, I started working various jobs like various management general management jobs that I didn't really like uh, and then at the end it would have been in October of 2016 so pretty much exactly two years ago uh, my my brother kept mentioning you know I could use a manager somebody to manage these houses at that point, we had uh, we had about four of our own, and we were managing 13 for this guy that my dad mentioned. Um, and I just helped out with that, helped get him, helped uh, you know get the maintenance under control, uh, helped a little bit on the leasing. Didn't really start getting full time until the leasing until about last year. But yeah, I mean, I do all the management we have right now. We have 
24 properties, but it's 41 doors. We have, uh, obviously we do a bunch of wholesaling. So I coordinate all of that. I do, do, I deal with all the closings and negotiating with buyers and sellers. So all that I deal, deal with the bookkeeping pretty much everything. So that's, I guess that's my role and how, how it's God, got. You're, you're a busy guy. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that is. <laughs> yeah. Is there time to sleep in there? Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I wake up, I wake up at this, this event. People always tell me, Oh, you know, you wake up at nine o'clock, you wake up so late. But I mean, I wake up and I just, I go and I just, I don't stop. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's time for, fun stuff. I mean, I go to, I go to concerts and I go to baseball games and stuff all the time. So there's enough time for that kind of stuff. But I mean, I like doing it. So it doesn't, it doesn't feel like some huge undertaking where I'm going to work every day. It's like, Oh, you know, another day at work. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely time consuming, but um, you know, I enjoy it. Cool. So we're, we're titling this show the opposite of turnkey. And as a result, I want to, we really want to illuminate all these different components of getting a property to market. And there's, you know, 20,000 different moving parts really to get it there. And I, I want to impress upon the listeners, all the things that have to go into it. So let's start at the beginning, just acquiring properties. Like what do you guys look for? How do you get them? What are some of the processes that you go through? How do you market to maybe distressed owners or things like that? And what are some of the processes that you have in place just for acquisition? Let's start there. Sure, I know it's really easy. You just go to on the MLS and you just put in about five offers and usually about three get accepted. <laughs> it's just really, really easy. Try to my right or as much as possible. <laughs> no, I know this is this is great. I'm looking forward to this answer because I know what, what it takes. Well, well, what's interesting about what you're saying is Jack is that, and I see that it's this is a lot of what all the online gurus preach. Yeah, is how easy this is. Yeah, you know, we see it. We even hear it from some of our investors. They don't they don't necessarily understand all the things that go into it. So this is going to be. Great. I really want to, I really want to do a deep dive with you guys yes. and, and find this out exactly all the things that you do just to acquire a property. Well, I mean, it, like, like you said, so much goes into it. Um, I would say the, the number one way we acquire stuff is through direct mail, which yeah, it sounds easy. You know, yeah, you just click a button, you send a postcard, but it costs money and you have to, you have to know, exactly what's going to be effective. I mean, for example, if you're buying houses in a certain zip code, then you might want to mail house, mail postcards to that zip code, but it's a lot, a lot more difficult because, you know, your response rate on those, even if you get 500 phone calls, you might have to send out 40,000 postcards. And that sounds incredibly low, but if you send out 50,000 postcards, spend 50, or 15,000 bucks on them and you make 30,000 bucks on one deal. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, but it isn't easy and, and most deals are not like that. Uh, so it, it's, it's a, it's a matter of answering the phone for one, I would say you gotta be consistent. Um, and two, there are other ways you gotta be creative. You can go to, <clears throat> you can go to Craigslist. Uh, you can go to Zillow, you can go to meetups and network with people. You can, you can meet with other wholesalers uh, you can, you know, network in your community. I mean, if you have a couple rentals, you probably know some people, you, you know, we've actually noticed recently that one great way to find leads is network with people who do lawns and uh, clean out houses because all they're dealing with is frustrated landlords. So don't tell them too much, Isaac. <laughs> um, but you know, it's a, uh, it's a matter of just being creative uh, and just, you know, Keep trying to turn up stuff any possible way you can. How many postcards do you guys send out in per month? I'm sure it varies. Um, I would say on average about thirty thousand. Thirty thousand postcards a month. Just about. That's, and that's uh, not all you do to market, right? Like you do other things. That's one part. That's, that's yeah. not even. That's not even that much. I mean, there are people who do. Yeah, there are people do more. Yeah. Just, but the, I think the real skill is the thing that's missing here. Uh, I, Isaac's older brother, Sam, is a computer uh, wizard, and he's very good at mining the data 
and figuring out who to send the postcards to. You know, if your target sure. is uh, people over 65 who live out of town and own a property here and have been cited for not mowing their grass or whatever, you know, he's, <laughs> he's good at finding those people. And uh, so the postcards aren't just going out at random, although sometimes they do. I mean, there have been times Isaac suggested once just 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 mail everyone in the zip code and we got a lot of stuff out of that so sure okay. the more you the more you pinpoint it and target yeah types of you know buyers who be, would be more prone to want to sell right i'm sorry sellers that would be right. more prone to sell i, I actually spend yeah. less money right on those postcards i actually uh, noticed when we that's that uh, zip code mailing he mentioned i think the reason one reason that did work so well i happened to mail it like around this time of year and people want black friday money like, so, so people, so we got a bunch of response from that, and it, it just so happened to coincide with Black Friday. Like all of them closed by Black Friday. <laughs> wow, that's a good tactic. I would have thought of that. Like I would not, I would not have never think of that. Yeah, yeah. it's great. But well, it's but, interesting but, the amount of money that you have to spend just to yeah. just to get that stuff out there. I mean, it's it's a pretty you're not playing around. I mean, that's a pretty significant financial commitment just to yeah. be able to get the leads. And then from that standpoint, I would imagine there has to be some pretty uh, strong, and I don't mean strong as in assholic, but I mean strong as in strong well, negotiating yeah. tactics <laughs> once you have a possible seller on the phone. I can imagine most of the people that are calling are very shocked at the prices that you're offering, right? Like they you have to have a lot of <laughs> candid conversations and I can't imagine it's always pleasant. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. I mean, somebody told me, uh, some, somebody uh, sent me a house the other day and it was a beautiful house. I mean, they had done so much, so much right with it, but the neighborhood is, doesn't justify going too high. And, and the price that I offered was probably like 25% of what they wanted. And he was like, you know, I should start sending out postcards and screwing people over. <laughs> if, the, if that works, that actually works and i was like you know i'm sorry i understand you know offers too low um i mean and i would say yeah definitely some candid conversations need to be had but i usually tell people before i even or before i or he even see the house i usually just tell them you know hey for turnkey rental around there this is where we're gonna be you know i'll give them a range of give or take three to five grand so they kind of know how things are looking and, you know, we, we don't usually go out to a place without knowing, you know, what they want. So we, we don't go to a rental where we want to pay $18,000 and come to find out they want $218,000. So we kind of yeah. we try to get a sense from people and also give that sense to people just so nobody's too offended. Or else they could just tell us on the phone that offer, you know, that's just not going to happen. And that's fine. That, well, that's this, part this, is, this is why you have to have the right person for the right job because... Isaac seems to be pretty good at offering someone a fourth of what they want for the house and everyone's still being kind of friends. I mean, I'm sure there are times when he gets yelled at, but yep. he, he, seems do, he seems to do a pretty good job of, of making these, uh, making these offers and uh, you know, enough of them come through and uh, without any hard feelings. Cause you know, that's the reality. Our, our numbers are based on what we can sell stuff for. They're not based on personal, feelings or anything it's yeah what the, market, what the market will bear plus a little bitty markup sure well one of the things i'm curious about is you know i know it's true in indy but really in every major city across the u.s there's seems to be like there's 12 billion wholesalers like that's how everybody is yeah. going to get i mean look we, there's always some guru that's coming to town and putting on the free seminar and then you got that weekend you have 500 new wholesalers in your town and yeah it's you know it's obnoxious really it is. Uh, but how do you that that creates a lot of competition for those uh wholesale properties how do you wade through all that competition well i would say uh, yeah. answer this one to start uh yeah uh, i would say by not considering them competition because most of the time what they have trouble finding is buyers you know they, they, everybody knows some little old lady in their church who has a house, who wants to sell her junky house and move back to Mississippi, but they don't know where to take it. So fine, be a wholesaler, find a house, bring it to us. We have buyers. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a great, great point. Yeah. So then in that case, there's 
two there's just two layers of markup which right. so it really is what makes it is, sense. right if the numbers still work for everybody then right. then we yeah. can get a deal done right you probably you probably had more than that right have you ever had like three four layers of wholesalers all in stacked on one deal i think the most we've had was three uh okay and that was actually just a couple months ago. I mean, that's what we've been trying to do lately. We we're trying to network with more wholesalers, go to meetups and, and yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's so much competition and some of them aren't just the type of people who are going to bring you deals. Some of them are just people who are doing their thing and that's, that's fine. Uh, but I think, you know, the way we try to do it is, is we try to, you know, I would say we are, you know, we're consistent through the seasons. I think some, some wholesalers kind of take it easy during the winter, uh, just because I figured, you know, it's moving, to, it's not really moving season. So we try to just stay consistent throughout the year. Um, and, you know, try to try to turn them into people who can basically be sellers for us. So I would say that's, that's one way. To try. The, the other thing is that we have something nobody else has. We have a parrot. That's the, uh, that's the company name. And we have this big goofy colorful looking parrot. And already in this town, everybody seems to recognize it. Every time I get up to say something at a meetup, people nudge each other and they're like, that's the guy with the parrot. And nobody ever asks why it's a parrot, but everybody recognizes it. So we have a recognizable brand. And we sort of, you know, the more business you do, the more business you're going to get from all those people. We've, we've been doing this long enough. We have a billboard. We, uh, we, our name is kind of out there. I'm always walking around handing out cards and talking to people. So, you know, we... Uh, and and on our postcards it doesn't say like on the generic you don't it's not like those generic postcards you get where it's like um my name is uh bob dylan and i want to buy your house and it's just there's no like personality to it or anything our postcards actually on the back of them you have the big obnoxious parrot and sometimes people do just call us saying i don't really want to sell my house but i did want to see what you guys are about just because of the just because of the logo because it's it, it jumps out of you. I've never gotten a postcard like that where it's like this big logo that made me so interested. Like, oh, you know, what's the story behind this? And it's people, good have, branding. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so take us through the next piece because I'm, you know, obviously, so you, you go and find a property, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, that property is not going to be ready for the next step. It's going to need some sort of rehab. Uh, now, you may be flipping it to somebody else as a wholesale deal, yeah. uh, but in many cases, you guys are also doing some buy and hold too. So right. what happens? Like, how is the determination made whether to wholesale it or to keep it, number one? And then from that standpoint, let's say you do keep it, take us through the processes that you would go through to get that thing rent ready. This is probably me. Um, I think what we're looking at, I, uh, I don't want to say we keep the best stuff, but, uh, but we do. We keep the, uh, we keep the stuff that's uh, just too good to let go of. That's, um, we're looking for stuff for ourselves that's, you know, we can't afford stuff in the heart of really great neighborhoods, but stuff that's right on the fringes of great neighborhoods, up and coming neighborhoods, between two great neighborhoods that are expanding. Yeah. Uh, Stuff that where the house is really solid in ways that a buyer probably wouldn't appreciate, you know. Um, we bought a hoarder house back in the spring, which I don't think we had to fight at all to get that house. It was stacked, not literally to the ceiling, but within about two feet with stuff. But the house was just solid as a rock. Uh, it took a ton of work. In fact, we just yesterday finished it up. And I think as of this morning, it's already rented. You know, we, we really made something beautiful of it. Yeah. We rewired it and plumbed it. And I don't think we're going to get a maintenance call for 20 years out of that thing. You know? Yeah. So we, we have something very, very particular we're looking for. And it's only one out of every probably 200 houses that we look at that we actually want. Uh, and, and all the rest is good enough to make a lot of people really happy. But we can, if, you know, we're, we're not buying very fast. We're not getting greedy so we can just pick the occasional really special thing that just works for us. It also has to play into our skill set. You know, it uh, has to be something that I know how to fix everything that's wrong <clears throat> and uh, can do it, you know, more or less affordably. Okay. 
So do you guys use any like uh, third party inspectors to keep you honest on the rehabs or are you confident that you can do it without that? Or I'm just curious. Oh yeah. No, I, I, you know, I've been working on houses for half my life, more, more than half my life. And we have a crew. One of our crew members is a guy who's the same between the two of us, you know, uh, there's not much that we don't, you know, that we can't figure out. So yeah, uh, we, we've yeah. never, you know, we use inspectors. We like inspectors are in these places occasionally for official purposes. Like if there's an appraisal, the bank hires an inspector, but we, we would never hire someone. To yeah. Them. Right. Gotcha. Just, just kind of curious. So that is, what, uh, what are, I'm just kind of curious. What, how do you then go about, you know, on the stuff that you're, peddling out that you're not keeping what is that sales process like well that is simply just i mean we we kind of go through the same process it just doesn't reach the same end point i mean we still go through the house and try to assess what it needs how much work it needs try to also base it at this point base it on past sales base it on not just past sales in the market but some of the sales we've we ourselves have done uh, so it's a similar process. I mean, we, we go through, we walk through the house, we try and figure out, you know, this is the number we want to hit when we go to the house. Uh, obviously we're not going to hit it every single time in terms of just what we want to get it for. Uh, so we go through a similar process, walk through, try to figure out, you know, rehab estimate, what it's, I, I don't, I mean, I try personally not to, you know, when I send out these houses, I try not to say, here's what it's worth. Here's the ARV. Here's the rehab estimate. Like, I try not to say those things because it's just, it's a good way of just rubbing people the wrong way if you're totally off. Um, we, we've got a term for that. We have called it over the last three years, wholesaler fluff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have a couple re, of the rehab part. number every single time that we're given is yeah. not even close to what it yeah, actually fluff. needs. We've gone over their budget every time. Yeah. It's always worth more than what we're told. So yep. that's why we love doing business with you guys because you don't do that to us. And yeah, you know, yeah. So. Well, yeah, it's well. not like it. I mean, even if we were right, it's like you know, congratulations. Because because like, I mean, you can't say this house has a 250k ARV. Like, how do you know that? Like, unless you flip the house next door, no, no you would know that. No idea. <laughs> uh, right. I was a, I was in a house the other day. Uh, my my job in this is just to go look at the house and take a thousand pictures. And just get a feel for, you know, what it's about and what the area is like. I was in a house the other day that really should be bulldozed, and the guy assured me that it could be fixed up for thirty-five hundred bucks. You know, he said he knew a guy, and if he were going to do it, thirty-five hundred bucks would get it. Thirty-five hundred bucks would buy a furnace. We should call that guy. He should. We should find his guy. <laughs> a lot of money. What did he want for it? Uh, he wanted thirty, and we were we were at like five, honestly. Five, <laughs> and even that is uh, that was generous. <laughs> the, the, the whole house was soaked with dog piss, you know. And when I yeah. when I walked through it, bugs jumped up and and clung to my body, and I carried them out with me. And you know, it was just it was it was just a horrible. May I not say what it was? It was bad. <laughs> One of the worst houses I've been in here. But thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah. The, wall, the basement walls, the foundation walls were caving in, and the floors were spongy. And uh. that's fifty bucks right there. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it? Did you buy it? Oh no. no <laughs> passed. No. Yeah, we, we passed. So. Well, we find you know for for what, when we rehab houses like that, it's just there. There's so many things that you don't even can't even see until you yeah. get into it, and then yeah. now you think it's a $20,000 rehab and now it's 30 and now the numbers are, it's over. Right. You're right. at a loss. Right. And right. Not only yeah. that, but you just had a stress headache that you really didn't need. There's other much easier deals. So question on, you know, the acquisition, what are you, how many of the properties that you're acquiring, are they severely distressed? Are they moderately distressed? Are some of them like, they're great. If the buyer would have actually, or the seller, would have actually listed on the MLS, they probably would have made quite a bit more. Like what, how often do you kind of, what's the mix that you see? I mean, I would say like two thirds of the time, they're pretty just mediocre average 
decent rentals that need a little bit of, of I guess you'd say TLC, uh, about 10% of the time, they're just total junk where they just either need to be totally redone or, or literally just rebuilt. Um, we try to stay away from those, honestly. We, I would say on average, we're buying stuff that's, you know, it's a rental um, and it's just maybe like a frustrated landlord. I would say a lot of what wholesalers get is from is from those those kind of guys is is people who are people who are wanting to sell their rental and you know they don't want to deal with the tenant or they don't they you know maybe the tenant just moved out and they don't want to do the work or they're too old to do the work or they don't have the money to do the work. So I would say about about fifteen percent of the time it's like beautiful doesn't need a thing. About fifty percent of the time it's just decent rentals there's some good stuff there's some bad stuff but overall more good than bad and then the remaining 35 percent, i would say is like pretty significant rehab jobs did that add up to 100 percent? i'm not sure I know. it's the new math 15, 50, <laughs> 35 i think so yeah <laughs> close enough right? yeah close enough hey if you're telling me that that arv on that fifty thousand dollar property is 95 we're gonna let this one slide yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Wholesaler all, talk. Yeah. 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 I mean, we don't, we, we've never talked that way. I mean, okay. like, I don't, I don't think we've ever sent out a property that said, oh, it's worth this. Cause that, that's just, I don't even know if you're allowed to do that, honestly. Like, I don't even know if you're allowed yeah. to say, you know, this is, it, you could say, like, we don't even say this house has a new roof. We usually say, like, it appears, you know, this house has yeah. a well, I don't know why any I don't know why any buyer would take any of that seriously anyway. You know, if yeah, some wholesaler sends you a thing and says, "Here's the cost, here's the ARV, and here's the repair costs," and so look at all the money you're going to make. Yeah, if you're just going to take somebody's word for that, you're not going to be in business for very long. So, I don't even see the point in saying that because I think most of our buyers are pretty serious institutional people who you know buy a lot of stuff from us repeatedly and yeah. Uh, hundreds of houses and I think if, if you say something like that they're just going to go yeah sure buddy you know, they're going to do their own they're going to do yeah. their own research also that's that's another question I would have for wholesalers is if if these houses are so great and there's nothing wrong with them at all why aren't you buying it? <laughs> why aren't you what why aren't you buying it then you buying it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're a wholesaler and this house is worth triple what you're asking I mean yeah. What are you doing that's selling? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't like tripling your money? Like, yeah, like, like you're just yeah. that, like, kind hearted. Oh, yeah. Just, <laughs> just doing it for, because they love people. Yeah, they just love people. They just want, yeah. want investors to do well. Right. Usually that's the guy that's just trying to get in the middle of the closing sandwich, is what we call it. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, let me take from this side and take from the other side and uh, not provide any value towards the equation, but yeah. I just want to slip in another eight or 10 K for myself. Yeah. You know, without doing anything. Yeah. Without doing anything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of doing something, I'm curious then to know um, of the ones that you keep and you're going to go out there and then market to tenants. What is that? Pro I mean, I'm assuming you're, doing a lot of C class stuff, you know, maybe some C plus, maybe some B minus. I mean, you know, you're pretty much in the same areas that we are. And uh, I'm curious to know, like, what's the process that you go through to find and keep good tenants for your, for your buy and hold properties? Well, uh, we try to, I mean, we try to get our, the stuff we're going to lease, we try to get it up to a certain standard and he could talk about that. Uh, but in terms of the leasing, side of things i mean we try not we try to do a pretty extensive background check we obviously check with previous landlords do a like an income verification check with their jobs and i mean we i mean we try to just find people i'll tell you a story about a tenant i met today um we try to just find people who we think are going to take care of the place and appreciate what we've done like we uh we worked on this hoarded up house and we got it finished pretty much this week uh and i showed it to a couple last night who liked it they weren't like blown away but they liked it and then i showed it to a lady today and she was just blown away by it she called me actually last night and she was like oh yeah you know i drove by the, by the house i saw your dad wearing a black shirt and and I, sh I showed her the house today and she was like oh wow this is so amazing she's like 
you know, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll build a fence for you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll help pave the driveway for you guys. I'll do this, I'll do that. So it's somebody who's going to take care of the place and, you know, wants it to be, you know, her place while she's there. I mean, obviously we own the house, but I think it's good if a tenant has some sort of ownership. I think those are always the best kind of tenant. Well, I think it's hard to find, I think it's hard for people like that to find, you know, C plus B minus properties that really are fixed up that nicely. Because, you know, by the time we got done, I mean, we tiled the bathroom, we refinished the floors, everything's, you know, we got a nice palette of colors and we redid the kitchen and it just really looks good. It's a very comfortable, nice house to be in. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not that easy uh, in that price range to find houses that are, you know, that well cared for. So it's, uh, I think that really helps in finding tenants. This place was finished at three o'clock yesterday, and he had it rented this morning. Um, yeah, fantastic! It's you're, you for for sure, Pete. You're pe preaching to the choir because we have this conversation in our office all the time about right. benchmarks and levels of rehabs, and you right. know what's the what's the quality of tenant that you attract based on the kind of rehab that you do. And, you know, honestly, we go into some properties that just don't need that much. So it's not, it's not like we're going to redo the whole kitchen and paint and put tiles in because it, it's the numbers don't work based on what we bought it for. But in, in the situations where it does need some work, uh, you know, we're definitely moving that needle now in our business and, you know, yeah. creating a, a nicer finished product. And the, the difference in what you are attracting is certainly noticeable. You know, and even just little stuff like yeah. cutting away the trees and some basic landscaping and making the outside look a little more. I mean, it's not going to be the Taj Mahal. We know that. But just, you know, <laughs> when they walk up, there, there's not like trash sitting on the side of the house and bushes all overgrown to where you can't see out of the window. And, you know, just yeah. some basic tree trimming and stuff like that really goes a long way. It's, you know, it's first impressions. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, uh, sure. I assure you, I assure you, not everybody feels that way about the quality of the product. Because I remember when I first started doing this, and I was going around with Isaac and looking at houses. We got a lead on a place, and the buyer showed up while we were there, or potential buyer, and uh, it was a kind of a beat up house. But I was looking around, and I was like, "Look, this guy really knew what he was doing. He'd done some." <laughs> shoring up in the basement. He beefed up some of the joists, and he really had done it just right. And I was pointing that out to the buyer. I was like, look, this guy really knew what he was doing. And look how he did this plumbing. This is heavy gauge copper. And the guy just put his hand up. And he said, not interested. He said, we're not putting out a quality product here. It's like, I don't care if the house is better. I don't care if it's worse. It's a house. You know? So that's your competition there, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I think we look at it a lot like you guys. We don't really... Yeah. yeah, we don't really have much competitors and, you know, we do things a certain way and we know we do it right. Yeah. And we just, we just stick with that. And we, you know, it took us a while to get to that point and to learn, you know, there's been some challenges along the way, as I'm sure you guys have had too. Uh, but it's, you know, when you get to a point where you know what you know and you stay in your lane, like my partner says, and, you know, it, everything just seems to, to work out and treat people right, you know, fairly. Uh, everything seems to work out okay. D doesn't mean it's without challenges. Um, okay. And speaking of challenges, that's kind of what I wanted to ask you too, because I know there's some some churn going on in the indie market, and there is, you know, just doing what you do. Obviously, you're going to run into some shenanigans. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear, like, <laughs> give us a good war story. Let's just just throw one out there because those are always fun. Everybody, Shecky in real estate is always 100% integrous that I've dealt with. Yep. So, totally honest, above board, always, always going to do the right thing. Always yeah, going to be fair. Well, we'll take a loss if it, uh, if they, you know, to just to do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. Don't don't about that. Wow. Okay. Um, so let's, let's hear I don't it. know what world you're living in, but I want to jump into it. So that sounds amazing. <laughs> it's my little <laughs> bubble that I yeah. want to live in, but it's yeah, not. That sounds solid. fantastic. So hit well, us with it, guys. What's what's happening? <laughs> what do you think? Um, I mean, I can tell a story about wholesaling. I'll I'll I'll, I'll let him tell the story about the uh, 
tenant issue we're having at uh, a house we call the Green Monster. I'll let him tell that one. I don't but, even want to tell that story. That, that, I don't think that's what he's talking about. We're, we're having yeah, a, that. That's fine, too. Like, yeah, we love tenant stories. Yeah, you know, we hear them all the time. Need, but investors need to know it's not always yeah. like, you know, a walk well, in the not. park. We, we, we have a woman who uh, was occupying a house and she got rats and she got rats because her neighbor is a hoarder. And uh, he's, he's the rat man, I think. But I think she also got rats through some of her own, you know, rats don't come to your house if there's nothing there that they want. So uh, we suddenly have a tenant who's, who's uh, we did a lot of work to get the rats out and we did a lot of other work to upgrade the house. And she's still upset and now she's out and everyone's mad at everyone. And I don't quite know what's going to come of it. But I think what you're actually asking about is some of the, scandalous people operating in this town who are, I don't know if they're headed for federal prison, but, uh, you know, some of them I kind of like to think so. Uh, and Isaac knows more about them than I do because uh, their buyers are now, after a couple of years, the people who bought houses from them are coming back to us and selling those houses for a fourth of what they paid for them. So uh, he can tell you more about that. Yeah. Go ahead. Quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> no, I mean we know who you're talking about, but I mean Isaac, I'm just curious to give walk us through a, a situation where you know maybe an investor didn't really get what they had bargained for because some corners were cut or things weren't done the way they should have been. Okay, well this is actually a perfect story because this is one we closed uh, today actually. Um, okay, so. In May of last year, I saw this house over on 19th, like 19th and Parker. Um, not not in good sh shape at all. Uh, needed pretty much everything. I mean, it wasn't totally hopeless, but it needed it needed two of everything basically. So and it needed twenty, thirty thousand worth of work. At least, yeah. Okay. At, at least, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's a smaller house, so that helps. But I mean, I actually got this house under contract like a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, I sold it uh, for not much. I mean, for like 10,000 um, bucks, like 10,000 bucks total, not like to me, like 10,000 bucks total. Um, and they sold it to somebody else out of state, I assume. And then about two weeks ago, I get a call uh, from this guy. And he's like, yeah, I got this house on 19th. I need, I need to sell it. And I was like, okay, what's the address? And he was like, uh, well, here's the address and immediately rung a bell. Uh, and I couldn't even get into the house because uh, there's been no communication from the management companies he switched over to. He did have a walkthrough video and he did at one point have an appraisal. So those were the, basically the pictures I was able to use. Um, but I mean, he was totally taken for a ride in terms of the rehab that was promised, the, the, uh, the bids that were promised to him that would be completed, nothing was completed. And um, it just, yeah, it just all went south pretty much. And he had to sell it for, he had to, I mean, he, I sold it to them for $10,000 and he had to sell it to us just, just now for $11,000. What did he pay? Like 45. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 25% just about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there, there are tons of people like that. And, you, and when you're on the phone with them, I mean, you can't help but feel for them because it's like they were promised X and they got mm -hmm. nothing even close to it. Because, I mean, we've had tons of people. No, I don't want to say tons. I mean, we've only bought like seven of these clients' houses about over the last, I would say, three months. So that's not a ridiculous amount of volume. But I've talked to plenty of people who, like I probably talked to like 10 or 15 more who didn't end up selling to us or, you know, haven't sold to us yet. Uh, who want to make it work, uh, but they're just, yeah, I mean, just, it's just bad for, for the, the, the whole The story was, and uh, obviously we're not going to mention any names, and we have no proof of anything, but this, there was this one particular group was getting really distressed houses and uh, marketing to people, marketing them to people with the promise that they would rehab them, put a tenant in, and then manage them. Now, some of them, that's exactly what they did. And some of these guys came out okay, and some of those houses are fine. But for whatever reason, uh, at some point they started getting distressed houses, not really rehabbing them, not really putting tenants in them, 
but then sending rental sending rental checks as if they were, and the only place to get that that money was from the next perspective, the next buyer. Yeah. So uh, that's there's a name for that. Um, they just kept uh, they just kept rolling from one to the next like that. Uh, and uh, then occasionally one of these people would actually fly to Indianapolis and see that his house that supposedly had a tenant in it was obviously sitting empty or had squatters or, uh, you know, had not been rehabbed at all. They were getting rent checks every month. The thing that, the thing that I, you know, I pointed this out to someone on bigger pockets, wait, there's been a tenant in your house for eight months and you have not had to repair anything. You haven't had a, a screen that got broken or a washing machine that broke. You just get that, you know, six hundred and thirty-five dollars and eighty-two cents every month. You know, that yeah. that should arouse people's suspicions. You know, you should expect some little yeah. thing in a, in a D in a property in a D neighborhood that was cheaply rehabbed. You know, you should uh, you should be alert to that. And and these people weren't. And and now Isaac's buying their stuff back for twenty-five cents on the dollar. And it's uh, I hate to see it because, you know, they're not all trust fund babies either. You know, I've talked to some of them. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're building contractors or they, you know, they have some job and they, they want to build up some money for their kid's college fund and, and they're losing it. So, yeah. yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, with? yeah it's, it's tough when we, uh, you know, we've sort of evolved in our business to being a very, 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 very finished product. In other words, just almost taking the superlative on the opposite side of that spectrum to where not only are we doing all the rehab, but we call, that's kind of why I was asking the third party question earlier to where we bring in a third party inspector to check our work. I mean, we too know what we're doing, but because we're selling to the end investor and we're also giving a warranty, we want to know that we did a good job and you know we can back our warranty but number two, we want the investor to understand that the rehab was done correctly. And then we put a tenant in, we manage it. So they're only buying something that's already finished being rehab, done, got the warranty. We're even showing them, you know, look, the place is leased. We've got a tenant. Here's a copy of the lease, you know, that sort of thing. So we're, we're very, very transparent about all that. And many of these people that have been through this horrific process that you just described, because there are thousands of them out there. Yep. Um, unfortunately, are at first incredulous that we're doing what we're doing uh, because they didn't really know that it could be that opposite. Um, but obviously, very, very appreciative as well too. Uh, but it, at this point, we feel like it's it's not only the right thing to do; it's kind of necessary in this marketplace based on some of the shenanigans that have happened. Uh, you know, we believe hey, obviously. It should be done right, and it should be done right every time. As I know, you guys feel that same way too. And um, anyway, it's uh, it's been a difficult time, I think, for some investors, and it's unfortunate. But thankfully, yeah. we're we're all moving through it. Some of those people are taking their licks. Many of them are. And uh, you know, between the four of us, you know, we're certainly having, I think, a pretty big impact on changing things for the positive and making sure things are done correctly. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, like I said, I mean, you can't, you can't help, but feel for these people when, when they, when you talk to them on the phone or, you know, whatever it is, cause you know, they're, they're told certain things and you could tell they were so excited when, when they, when they got the house, they're like, you know, I'm going to have this and I can, you know, you know it'll be like a, a family thing. Um, you know, some of these people plan to, you know, give these houses to their kids or something and, yeah. uh, and it just didn't work out. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a definitely a horrible stain, but I, I mean, I hope there's, there's some sort of way to, to redeem it in terms of getting it, getting it on track. You know, so Indy, that, it's sad sure. because Indy's a great cash flowing market. I mean, it's, it's one of the yeah. best in the country, right? So it yeah. didn't have yeah. to be that way. If it was just no, it processes <laughs> were done correctly. Yeah. And we were planning for long-term sustainability. Yep. You know, it would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they could have done it right and still, still maintained. Yeah. The, the independent inspection thing is a is a huge thing uh, because the company we're talking about, and there's no, still no one has breathed the name, but uh, that was part of the thing. You can't inspect the house. That was that was 
of their system. You're, you're not allowed to inspect it. Now, why? I don't know why anyone would sign up for that, and I don't know how they tried to justify that. Yeah. You can't get an inspector. That's we'll just get in the way. You know? Well, I think it's called really, really good marketing, and uh, yeah, you know, well, there. I mean, so let me speak to that really quick. So, from a from us as a sales point. When it, whenever a, a seller buy, uh, orders an inspection, it is a major pain in the ass. It, it, you gotta, especially if the property is tenanted. Yeah, you gotta schedule around the tenants. That is yep. a major can be a major problem right there. Mm -hmm. Then you don't know what kind of inspector you're gonna get. Are they gonna have you know A class expectations for a C class property? Are they gonna like a lot of them do? So then it delays the sales process too, right? Whenever they order the inspection, you gotta take, and they could delay it by a month. So when yeah. you're, when the company, they're trying to churn and burn, the right. inspection was just a, was just a, a nuisance. It was a big pain and it delayed their sales process. So right. that's understand. one reason. So that's why we do them up front with an independent right. um, company yeah. so that we don't have to like worry about once it's tenanted and it slows right. down the whole sales process and we can still provide that peace of mind to our buyer that, hey, this did get independently third-party inspected. So, right, right, yeah, exactly. That's the thing, you, uh, it was a pain for them, I understand that, it's a pain for you, but you go ahead and do it, so that's the difference. You know? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> I mean, we wanna know that we're selling a quality product to our investor, yeah. we don't yeah. want a repeat of that uh, fiasco. So. Right. Yeah, we, we would rather deal with the happy pain in the ass stuff now than the horrible pain in the ass stuff later. Right. <laughs> that's, I think that's in general a really, a really good idea in real estate, uh, in, in, in this kind of investment. I think that's really a good idea. And it, it goes through everything. And that's why like these places we're buying and keeping, you know, the, not all of them, but the little places like the hoarder house, you know, every wire's new, every pipe is new, every plumbing, uh, you know, every faucet and light fixture and switch. And so, you know, just do that up front because it's so much easier than coming in 50 times over the next five years to fix it yeah. and just in it's just as a general rule i think that's true of everything you do in this business just get it over with you know uh, at the beginning yeah. 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 but let me interrupt yeah. let me interrupt the uh, flow here for a second sure. i think i think i'm supposed to go look at a house at four o'clock oh no he's he, he called and canceled don't worry about it Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. All right. I thought it was going to weird your podcast by skipping out in the middle. No, no. Don't worry about it. So, so I have one kind of probably, probably final question, but, you know, given that you guys, you know, we're kind of, we're calling this episode, you know, the opposite of turnkey and it's all this sort of, yeah. you know, work and elbow grease to go all the way through the process. Yeah. What would you say in, in all of things that, that you do, all the process that you have, is the area where that you find the most challenging? Well, I, I would I would say the part I do, and Isaac would say the part he does. I, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> right, right, right. Now we, right now we have a bottleneck because uh, I think I told you we bought a big package of 10 duplexes at once. All of them had a lot of deferred maintenance. We've done a lot of, we've had a lot of acquisitions since then. Some of them needed total rehabs. So we have a bunch of stuff standing empty right now, not because Isaac can't get it leased, but because it's uninhabitable. But we're about to, we turned one of those over yesterday. We're about to turn over four or five more all, of, all at once. So that's going to get a lot better. But yeah. we, have a, we have a bottleneck that we acquire stuff. We have a small crew. We, uh, we don't want to just hire it out and pay contractor prices to fix it up. We'll fix it up better and cheaper. Uh, and that'll be better in the long run. But uh, that, to me, that's our biggest problem is that I'm working, you know, 55 hours a week and still feel like I'm doing about half what I should. My crew's working hard. Uh, we still have places standing empty. And as you as I said, you know, the one that we got ready to rent yesterday, he got it rented this morning you know, before noon. So they're just sitting there waiting and we can't quite get them done. So. That's that's my take on what's difficult. He probably has a completely different one. Um, mine would be uh, in terms of, I mean, I would say the biggest challenge is vacancy. Uh, I, I would say especially this time of year. And, and I, I've told him this 
several times. It's like, you know, vacancy, this, and this is in a way it, it becomes a good thing. So I'll, I'll think of something else too, but vacancy, it, it all, it, you wish it could just be like everybody moves out every four months. Like, you know, somebody moves out in, in April and they tell you in December and then somebody else moves out in September and they tell you in May. It all kind of just happens all at once. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'm moving out next week. And it, it all sort of happens at once. Uh, but in a way, it can be a good thing because the same way it goes bad is, is the same way it goes good. Because you, you get in, you fix it up, you rent it out, and then everything's fixed. I mean, I remember last year we had, a, we had the same vacancy problem, same time of the year, where like six people moved out, like in the same inside of a week, basically. And then... We just had to fill it all and we i filled like i think we had to fill like nine units and we got it all filled in basically um three four weeks basically so i would say vacancy yeah vacancy is i think is probably the most costly yeah as far as being and owning property because a long come with vacancy is that you know once it's vacant and you lose the rent you can never ever get it back you can't recoup yeah. that, right it's just gone yeah. forever yeah. the other part right is the tenant turn costs so yeah. yeah you have to that's part of the damaged or if anything so you know but that's c-class property right i mean yeah. yeah you can get really strong returns stronger much stronger than a or b class and you got to put up with you know a little bit more um you know transient nature uh, they're not giving you like you said generally speaking they're not giving you months in advance that they're going to be moving on right it's usually about two weeks <laughs> two weeks if you're lucky if you get two weeks <laughs> yeah but yeah we, I mean, sometimes it's a month we try to get the best tenants we can but it, it is yeah i mean it, vacancy like we um somebody told me three weeks ago they were moving out and then the next week somebody told me they were moving out and then the next week i actually had to find out somebody was moving out and I just asked them, like, hey, is this true you're moving out? She was like, yeah, you know, I bought a house in Anderson. <laughs> so, so she just yeah. told me. So. We, go, we go through other spells where, you know, Isaac will get everything literally 100% occupied except for, you know, the long-term rehabs that can't be rented. We've had yeah. uh, we've had spells where we had 100% occupancy you know, running for months at a time. So, and I'm sure we'll get back to that. Uh, yeah. Great. What, so you. what do you think the tenant demand is like in, you know, in Indy? I mean, is it, is it still strong? I mean, what, what is your perspective? You got what, 40, how many units you have? 41. 41. So, yeah. I mean, you got, you got quite a portfolio. I mean, what's your perspective? I mean, I think the tenant demand is pretty strong. I mean, I think there are good tenants out there. I mean, I, I don't think we've had any trouble saying like, oh, you know, there's just nobody qualified looking at this house. I, th I think there, are, I think there are plenty of good good tenants out there who will pay a fair price if they if they get the sense that what they're paying for is is you know worth what you're asking if, if mm -hmm. i mean if if you're asking for uh you know 900 bucks for a two-bed rental but you know there's trash like you said earlier like there's trash in the floor and you know the the, the the yards aren't mowed and all this stuff then then they won't appreciate it but i think tenants will appreciate if they get the sense that you know, you are, you did your part, basically. I think, I think if you did that, there's a strong demand. They're not, ex their expectations are not sky high, right? Like no, they, no. they understand they expect that everything works, right? They just want everything to work and have a, you know, a yeah. comfortable place where they're, when they have issues that they, they get taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. And if you I provide think that, don't they stay? I mean, yeah, for yeah. the most part. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we've had uh, we bought some places that already had tenants in them. We bought one place in particular out near Irvington. We bought it with two tenants in it. I never set foot in it until we'd owned it for about a year. And then I went over to repair some little thing and I was looking around. And I was like, this is horrible. Why didn't you complain about this? Because there was a lot of stuff I would have wanted to fix if I'd known about it. And the lady said, well, you know, the last landlord, we kept asking and he just wouldn't do it. So we just we just gave up. And when you bought the place, we figured it would be the same, you know, they just never bothered to ask anymore, you know, and wow. they were just, just, they were just completely stunned that we went in and did a bunch of stuff that they didn't, I'm mean, not to brag on this because I think we're just bringing it up to a reasonable standard. It's still not anything fancy, but they were just shocked that we went in and fixed a bunch of stuff because, you know, they hadn't even asked for it and we're not even through there, but I think they're, uh, the standard is, uh, not that high with a lot of landlords and uh, tenants don't necessarily expect things to be 
like they might in you know expect in other other places. Um, that's no excuse for not providing a good place, but uh, sure, that's that seems to be the climate here. That there are a lot of landlords who just you know, just the very minimum, you know. Yeah, I love hearing that too because you know we run into that all the time, and you know we we experience the same thing on our property management side when people are presented with a good nicely rehab property and you know they're taken care of they're very happy and they stay and you know they're not expecting a palace but uh there's a certain level of expectation that's not that hard to meet that when you do meet it, it creates yeah. some really really good results for for everybody you know so it's yeah. i love to hear that you guys are on the same page because we're very much right there with you it's very it's exciting so i, I know we're running out of time but what uh, my favorite question is you know, uh -oh. that you want to share with that you may want to share with our listeners is what's the question that we didn't ask you that we maybe should have asked? Well, the last podcast I did, they asked me if you could be one particular crayon out of a box, which crayon would you be? <laughs> That's as good as any. Which crayon would you be? Wow. Well, I, I don't have a particular color, but I said I'd be one of those little broken, little broken pieces down at the bottom of the box where all the paper's torn off, you know, and there's not much left of it, but, but you can get a little more work out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to send you over to my shrink there, Pete. There's some like, you know, you know, you, issues or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He's been doing, you know, this too long. Yeah, I think so. Bro. I, I told him, take it to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, said, I said no. And now look. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think, okay, I think the one question people usually ask us is where does our name come from? But I think you guys know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, you said you had a parrot. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Sam has, Sam has parrots. He has, he has eight of them, actually. So. That makes, wow. that makes when, he, when, he, when he first when he first moved out here he uh he was building a computer company web uh, web design and hosting and he didn't know anybody here he would just sit on his couch all day with a parrot on his shoulder with his laptop on his lap and built up a business like that so a uh, parrot was the thing and people have said to me you know that doesn't make any sense you know your uh your brand has to have something to do with what you're selling but my answer to that is like Apple computer, you know? Yeah, right. right. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that like argument, but that really puts it into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously you guys are doing a lot of business, so it hasn't hurt in any capacity. If it has, well, we like the name. Right? <laughs> You're happy. <laughs> what else matters? Yeah, exactly. our, our parent, we're keeping it. Right. <laughs> well, and I, I think you're you're speaking to also in my mind we've talked a lot about this on this episode is the quality of the work and the way you move through your day and the way you manage your business yeah. has a lot bigger implications towards your success than what your name is. Yeah. I yeah. mean our company is an extremely generic name and we yeah. do just fine. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, I'm kind of. I have a little bit of bird envy right now, but that's another right. story. Well, the, <laughs> the parrot wouldn't help if we weren't all three working 50, 60 hours a week. Yeah. Well, and you guys are doing. Not, it's not just the amount of work you're doing; it's the quality of work and the way that yeah. you the way that you do it. And I think that yeah. that speaks volumes. Yeah. No, I'm just referring to the the notion that this is an easy business and anyone can do it with no knowledge and no money and no work. Yeah. That hasn't yeah. been our experience. No, yeah, so, uh, you guys got a specialized skill set. You've got a craft that you've certainly yeah. put a lot of time, effort, money into to develop. And you made I'm sure you've made lo lots of mistakes along the ways that, you know, you learn and get better from those. And yep. I, you know, yeah, anybody who thinks that uh, any success in any area of life is easy. I mean, they, they just, they don't really understand what it takes yeah. and what yeah. goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a ton of time that goes yeah. into it. So if our, if our listeners wanted to find you and look you guys up, how would they do that? Well, they can call us at 317-204-2900. That phone number just goes directly to me, so they'll, they'll get me directly. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes, too. Yeah. Okay. And you can also reach our website at either parrothomebuyers.com or parrotwholesaling.com. 
Uh, and honestly, if, if there are people who are out there listening who are looking for a place to rent, you can look at our website, which is just parrotpropertymanagement.com. Okay. So, I good. may have to, uh, I'm writing all that down, but we'll, we'll get all that in the show notes. Okay. And uh, guys, this has been great. I'm super yeah. appreciative, as I'm sure Jack is too, that you were able to come and share these insights and really help our audience understand all the crap you know that goes on yeah. behind the scenes. I mean, it's a lot of work and you, yeah. know, you guys are out there busting ass and doing it. So yeah. kudos to you, you know, yeah. if we've, if we've just discouraged one person, it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I like the title, like the opposite of turnkey. Like if you think about all these gurus saying like how easy it is, it's sort of like, this is the opposite of guru in a way yeah. too. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you really, yeah. you really want to do this business? Yeah, come on. This is, yeah. this is what it's really all about. You I mean, know? It's, a, it's a fun business, but yeah, it is, it is work. Definitely work. Yeah. yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to create the impression we don't love what we do. We, we really, yeah. we really do. I, I For sure. not every single minute of it every single day, but, uh, but basically it's, it's a great business to be in, but the idea that you can do it from a rocking chair is just not, that's just not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Understood. thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. you joining us. Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah.